I am, I am so, I don't know if I'm going to do a good job preaching this, but this is probably one of the most important sermons God ever gave me. And I didn't want to save it for north, because I believe that God gave me this word for south. Yeah. And everybody who's in this room is supposed to be in this room. And everybody that's in overflow, y'all give it up for everybody that's in overflow. God bless you all. We love you. And to everybody watching online, um, I need you to stay in tune with what I'm going to talk about over the next few moments because I am about to tell you why your season hasn't come yet. You know, all of that praying and journaling and vision boarding and, and, and fasting <laughs> that you've been doing and, and you like, well, when is it going to be my time? I'm about to tell you today why it hasn't happened yet. And after that, I'm going to tell you how to fast forward it because this is the year of manifested promises and we are in the month of promotion. How many of you know that God has a promotion with your name on it? All right, tech team, y'all ready? We got two passages of scripture. I'm gonna read Galatians 4, 5, 6, and 7. I'm gonna, I'm not preaching from Acts, but I wanna, I'm gonna show you a principle in Acts chapter two, verse one through four. So. Understand that the substratum of my delivery will be extrapolated from Galatians 4. But Acts 2 will be a reference. And if, if, you've, if you have a Bible, an uh, actual physical Bible, you will. there used to be a thing for those of us who carry Bible. There was a reference section that you could go and look at all of the different scriptures that reference the, the theological point that God was pointing out. Anybody still got physical Bibles? Maybe not here today, but still, you need to have one. You need to have one. I'm, I know you might not bring it to church. You might use your app. But when you study, there is, there is nothing like putting your hands on real books. I, I have audio. I do all of that kind of stuff. But I got me some real books, y'all. Because sometimes the, the battery will die. But you got to have you got to have that word. You got to have that word. I want to read Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. I really, you know what? This is what I'm going to do, tech team. I know I gave y'all seven verses. I, I I just only want to read this one, and then we'll go to Acts. Um, but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth a son. I want to stop right there because it didn't, he didn't send his son because the world was in sin. And he didn't send his son because of what Adam and Eve did exclusively. All of that had happened. It was many years later. Why didn't he send Jesus the day that Eve bit the fruit? Why would he wait for Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel and going on and on and Boaz and going on and on and David and we get to Paul and, and we get to us? Why did Jesus wait until the days of Herod to send forth Jesus? Why didn't he send him earlier after all the world was in sin yeah. he didn't do it because God doesn't react to crisis listen to me because some of you all think God is not real or he is not good or your prayers don't work because he doesn't respond when you hurt bad he let his own son suffer for a whole weekend so God doesn't respond to tragedy he responds to the fullness of time. <laughs> I'm telling you, you, this is the most important message I know he's given me this year. 
and we will go down in history remembering this day and you will be thanking God because this did not happen in an arena with 10,000. This did not happen at a conference. It happened in a room that has about 500 people in the main room, a couple of more people in an overflow room, and thousands watching online. And you've got to ask yourself, God, what have I done that thou art mindful? Oh, you're not getting this. Because some people have been turned away from this building. Some people couldn't get in. Some people online, they didn't feel well. They couldn't get here. What is it about you that you got that seat, listen, that last week somebody else was in? Must be something special about you. Just touch your name. It's something about me. Just, it's, it's something about me. It's something about me. About me. I don't know yet. I'm about to find out, but I know it's something. Acts chapter 2. Do I have your permission to unpack this? Y'all got anything to do after this? Where y'all going? Y'all got, got to go to Subway, any place, wherever you want to go. No. I got one. I got one today. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost, oh, well, when the, when, when the fullness of time had come, Because remember, Pentecost marks the 50th day after the resurrection of Jesus. Why didn't Pentecost happen after 20 days? Why didn't it happen after 40 days? What was it about the 50th day? Why did the children of Israel walk in the wilderness for 40 years? It was an 11-day journey because they did not get out until the fullness of time come until they learned every lesson they needed to learn until they understood who they were until they see there's the reason why it ain't your time yet is because the fullness of what God is doing hasn't happened yet God is not going to give you a full victory on partial effort you know <laughs> some of y'all think it's going to happen because you did good before God said, the fact that you did good before and you went back to the behavior that you had before lets me know you are not ready. The fullness of time. Here's the word I want to preach today. Not a moment too soon. God told me to tell you it's not going to happen a moment sooner than you are ready for it to happen. And I know that ain't what you want to hear, but by the time we finish, you'll be shouting. But right now, I want you to tell everybody on your way down to your seat, it's not going to happen a moment too soon. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Would you all praise God for this music ministry? Who's ready to grow in the Lord today? Did you just see uh, Pastor Rama perform uh, the uh, dedication for the baby? Were you paying attention? When they told me uh, who the baby was, and I realized immediately that there was a connection to the child and Pastor Rama. I immediately abstained from doing the duty because I thought it would be apropos for the relationship to continue. And I didn't feel that I needed to step into a movie that was already in scene. It wasn't my time. I'm the pastor. Literally, when I came in the room, there are three people on the production team that came up to me right away and said, would you like to do it? I had the authority to do it. I had the ability to do it, but it wasn't my time. You, you have to know what's for you and what's for somebody else. What I did not know is that the lady who was related to the baby was the person that introduced Pastor Rayma to the person that introduced him to me but my instinct said step out of the way because it is not your time he's Nigerian they are Nigerian and let me tell you something if you know anything about America and Africa although there are some similarities there are some stark differences 
In fact, culturally, you know, in this room, we have African Americans. I'm looking at uh, Asian Americans, uh, Hispanic Americans. In this room, there are all kinds of people. Let me tell you, one of the places we differ the most is food. Uh, the, the ingredients. Basically, we all eat chicken, but we just make it differently. Everybody eats steak, we just make it differently. Everybody eats rice. Can't nobody make rice like Africans, but we all <laughs> like rice. But it's different. We, we differ in food. We differ in languages. Sometimes uh, Pastor Raymond will go from speaking Igbo back to English, and, and he'll be doing all kind of stuff. And when he's talking stuff I don't understand, I back out. And when he comes back to English, I'll step in and act like I knew what was happening the whole time. <laughs> we, we, we all differ. And like, listen, matter of fact, let me put it this way. We different how we parent. Yeah. Or in this room, we have some timeout parents. <laughs> Raise your hand if you're a timeout parent. You go to your room, Johnny, you can't say anything. You eat your Brussels sprouts so you don't come outside. We got punishment parents. Raise your hand if you're a punishment parent. You mess with me, I take the PlayStation, the cell phone. God bless you. We got some knock your lights out parents. Some of y'all are both. You start off with the punishment, but you mess with me, you're going to make me turn into my mama, and I will knock you out. By the way, you're supported by the scripture. The Bible says, beat them, and they will not die. Read your Bible. Oh, that's what the Bible says. Well, that's going to be on TikTok in about five minutes, ain't it? <laughs> Are we different parents? Parenting, some parents yell and scream. Some sit down and have conversations. And let me tell you something. We all differ because of how we were raised. That's the bottom line. We all, we all, we're all different. We're different politically. We're different politically. We, we are, we're different in how we spend and save our money. We're different in how we dress. We're different. You can go right on this same street and find 50 different styles of worship because it's, because it's okay to be different. The only thing I ask is, while I accept you for who you are, please accept me <laughs> for who I am. I think the, the, the grossest adjustment is that I have to adjust for you to be happy, but I'm supposed to be happy with the deliverance of yourself. If I have to adjust for you, you should have to adjust for me. That is the tolerance that we have in this thing we call the United States of America. Everybody differs, but the one thing you would think that we all should and could agree on is time. If church starts at 10, no, I ain't, I ain't throwing no shade, just stay with me. Because to be honest with you, I'm just glad you're here. I don't care if you came at 1010, 1005, 1030. As long as you got in the room, I am glad you are here. <laughs> Let me tell you something. I don't care where you live. You got seven days in a week. You got 60 seconds in a minute. I don't care. I don't care where you live. You, you can't get rich enough to buy 65 seconds in a minute. You get what I'm saying? You, you can't get fine enough to get eight days a week. You can't talk your way up on 37 days in a month. I don't care if you go to Angola or you go to Australia. I don't care if you, I don't care if you go to Atlanta. I don't care if you go to A-Leaf. You, you're going to have the same amount of time that I have. I don't care if you're a millionaire or you're just barely making it. When the clock strikes 12, it's 12 for all of us. Are you listening to me today? You can't buy more time. You can't manipulate your way into more time. Listen, and as powerful as God is and as good as your relationship is with him, you will never be able to pray and get more time than he's already promised you. You will die at your appointed time, and I don't care how much kale you eat. I don't care if you become a vegan. I don't care if you eat bacon. You're out of here when you're out of here. Now, the quality of life, 
can be improved by the habits you choose. But to every man there is a season. To everything there is a time under the heavens. A time to be born and a time to die. Are you, are you reading... Are you reading me here today? I want you to hear what I'm saying because time is one of those things that I think that we should be able to agree on. And yet I can assure you that it is one of the places that we disagree the most. If I say church starts at 10, for some of y'all that means get up at about 7.30, 8 o'clock. That means already having everything ready the day before. That means making sure that you are in a car at a certain time so that you can be here at a certain time. For some of y'all, when I say 10 o'clock, it means uh, I'm going to get up at 10. And see, when you get up at 10, you're already late. Some people believe in being fashionably late. Some people believe... Uh, and how many of y'all, be honest, some of, if you got here and church started at 10, it doesn't matter what time it starts. If it ain't a whole lot of people here, you're going to sit outside until some people come in. That's what they do at the club. That's what they do in other places. You don't want to be the first. You know the party started at 11 o'clock, but you didn't leave home till 11 because you don't want to be there first. Y'all stay with me because we're talking about somebody say time. Now, that is, that is, that is true of, of most of us, and it doesn't matter where you go. You get 24 hours a day. You get seven days in a week. So when you look at somebody who is more successful than you, you have to ask yourself, what did they do with their time that you did not do with yours? When you are praying and asking God to help you pay a bill and somebody else is helping somebody else pay their bills, you've got to ask yourself, what did that person do with their time that you didn't do with yours? When you woke up this morning, what did I do with my time that you didn't do with yours? When you woke up this morning, what did you do with your time that the person behind you did not do with theirs? Because all of us have the same amount of time in a day. Oprah Winfrey and the person under the bridge has the same amount of time in a day. So the question is not, I didn't have time to do it. The question is, what did you do? Come on, y'all. with the time that you had. If you graduated high school, we were all in there for 12 years. What did you do with your 12 years that somebody else didn't do with theirs? And college was available to you if you, get, if you went and you didn't go. And some people are doing better than people who went to college. And I'm not saying it either way. I'm just trying to get you to understand and think about time management. What are you doing with your time? And, and meanwhile, why I am doing all of this talk about time, you leave America and time doesn't mean the same thing. Okay? Now, I said today we started at 10. What time did we start? 10. Now, I preach in Africa three times a year. We ain't never started at the time they said we were supposed to start. They told me church starts at 7. Me and my wife are in the lobby at 7.40 waiting on them to show up. And here I am frustrated like, what's wrong with people who don't value time? And, 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 and it brings out American colloquialisms because we say stuff like, don't waste my time. We say stuff like, time is money. Are you with me so far? Don't waste my time. Time is money. Because look at how we look at time. And, and, and when I get, when I get to, to dig deep down in it, look at, our, look at our history. We even have in our language specialized uh, 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 phrases uh, to help us to be able to differentiate between time, past, present, and future. I was preaching. I am preaching. I will preach because even in our language, we are able to differentiate between time. But when I was in seminary, my, my Greek professor, H. Wayne House, taught us uh, that in the Greek language, they have something called the aorist tense. And the aorist tense is when a verb is in the past. I thought I had Greek only to get there the next week for him to teach us that there is past aorist and future aorist. So that means in Greek, the past can be in the future. 
So y'all going to go to sleep, and you're going to be sleeping when the message comes, and when it drops, you're going to be sleeping. That's why only 1% of y'all are going to get it. In, in Greek, the past can be in the future and in the present. Because they don't, they don't differentiate time like we differentiate time. In the English language, we can fluctuate between time without effort. I'm speaking. I spoke. I will speak. On the contrary, watch this. In Indonesia, they have no verb tense. God, help me in this place today. So, 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 so watch this. In Indonesia, uh, there is a term called sayang. Everybody say sayang. S-I-A-N-G, Sion. What does Sion mean? Sion means when the sun begins to get hot. So, so if you ask a person in Indonesia, when does church start? They don't say 10 o'clock. They say church starts when it gets hot. Lord, I'm telling you, listen, 50% of them are going to miss it. But the 50% of y'all who got enough attention to stay focused longer than three minutes, your life is about to change. Church starts when it gets hot. When is church over? Sorry. Church is over when everybody gets what they need. Okay. So what I learned when I went to Africa, they are not not starting church at seven o'clock because the host is not worried about time. He understands that everybody doesn't have a vehicle like you have, and the, the, the road to get to the church is only two lanes, so everybody has to come in on the same artery. So the reason why they delay church is not because they are not time conscious. They understand church doesn't start until it's hot. And the reason why you can go to Africa and church can last four, five, six, seven hours is because they understand that church should not be over until everybody gets. And the reason why we got rich Americans who are still depressed and still rejected and insecure is because we got God on a watch. And if he don't act in the next 60 minutes, we're going to get on Instagram and go to sleep. But for those of y'all who are going to wait on the fullness of time, Touch your neighbor and say, I'm going to wait on God. I'm going to wait on God. I'm going to wait on God. <laughs> Indonesians say church starts. Listen, we're not starting church until everybody who needs to be in the room is in the room. And we're not ending church until everybody gets a breakthrough. The problem with Americans is because we are so time conscious and so arrogant, we think that God does things on a clock like we expect things to be done on a clock. But God says, I don't know where you got that from because to me a day is a thousand years and a thousand years is but a day. I don't keep time like you keep time. Time is too small for me. I don't do anything in time, but I do things on time because I am not able to fit in time. I, I can ride in your life on time so what I'm trying to tell you today is that sometimes you got to wait on the Lord because God is not going to give you a boot just because you turn 30 and just because you're gonna have a high-risk pregnancy after 35 you asking God to do it right now God says I'm not doing it right now because your life ain't in order for me to give you what you want I'm not giving you what you want in time but I will give it to you in the fullness So God says, I'm going to start when everybody in your life needs to be there. Oh, God, help me, mighty Jesus. And I'm going to start when you get the folks out of your church that ain't supposed to be in your church and get the people in your life, that's a metaphor, that are supposed to be there. I'm going to give it to you when the fullness of time comes. I'm going to give it to you when your jealous friends ain't going to hate on you and try to tear it down. I'm going to give it to you when you get that no good person you dating out of your life you know that I told you to get rid of a long time ago. And so since you want to stay in your circumstance, you're going to stay out of my blessing. Oh, look at your name and say, you might as well cry because he's going to smack you right upside your head because some of y'all trying to negotiate with God. Well, God, just let me just keep him for another six months and see how it's going to work out. God, let me just stay here for another five months to see how it's going to work out. God says, I ain't giving you nothing because if I give you what you're asking for, you're going to share it with somebody I don't want to have it. <laughs> Slap five people and say, he talking to you. 
and I ain't scared of none of you. I came to break curses. I came to slay demons and devils. I came that you may have life and have it more abundantly. And it ain't going to happen a moment too soon. And guess what? Guess what? Anybody who's been a part of this church a long time will tell you, I don't shut up because you don't say amen. You can unfold your arms and take that scour off of your face because I came to fight the devil today because we have been in church and in God too long to still be begging for a cell phone bill. You have been saved too long to still be crying about not being able to fill up your gas tank. God said, I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. You've got to ask yourself, what is it about my life that keeps me from having abundance? You think God picked you to just be broke forever? What purpose does it serve? Why would he pick you? above everybody else to suffer for no reason at all. It ain't like you got a television program. It ain't like if you struggle, millions of people are going to be changed. Don't nobody know you but the folk who know you. So why? Why are you robbing Peter to pay Paul? Why are you depressed five days out of every week? Why can't you ever get the breakthrough that everybody else experiences? What is it about what you're doing with your time that keeps it from being your time? Lord, help me in this place today. In Africa, in Indonesia, watch this, they understand that effectiveness is more important than schedule. Literally, church can start at 6, and I've been in there at 1 o'clock, and people are still praising God, and they walked to church. You spoiled Americans. You drove here in air-conditioned cars and still walked in with an attitude. Oh, come on, help me, somebody. We got air conditioning in this building. It ain't as cold as it need to be, but go to church in Africa. It ain't hot as it could be. And let me tell you right now, it's hotter in Houston than it is in Africa. It's 172 degrees outside right now. It was 101 this morning. You ate breakfast, or you could have. You rolled here. You have a seat. You have lights. You have electricity, you have air conditioning. In churches that I preach at in Africa, you can only flush the toilet on certain days. They have the tub full of water so that in order to flush the toilet, you have to get a bucket out of the tub because they filled it up on the days they could have water. And to flush the toilet, you take the bucket and you pour it down the toilet to flush the toilet. And yet they are praising God with an extreme amount of joy. And yet, I'm looking at some of y'all with your Zara and your Fashion Nova on, looking at me like God ain't been good. That's why it ain't your time yet. Because you don't understand that God don't show up until it gets hot. I need every cold person in the room to get out. Because all of us hot folks are about to get it on in here. I want you to make sure you look down your row and tell everybody he ain't coming until it gets hot. He's not coming until everybody on our row is on one accord. He's not coming until everybody in the room. Watch this. The benefit of starting a service when everybody arrives is you know for sure that everybody who's there means to be there. Because if Americans, if we come to church at at 10 o'clock, and at 1045, it hasn't started yet. We're going home. So, 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 so maybe sometime we might need to do that to separate the wheat. We, we, I, I, one day I might start church late just to see who will sit and wait on the Lord. Because they that wait on the Lord 
shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will walk and not be weary. They will run and not faint. Can I just get about 16 people in here right now to make this room hot so the Holy Spirit can show up and do what he's supposed to do? Tell somebody, say, I'm waiting on God. Like I told you, in, in Indonesia, they wait, watch this, they're waiting on everybody who's supposed to be in the room to be in the room before they can start church. And let me tell you right now, some of y'all got to get some people out of your life because everybody who's supposed to be in your life is not in your life. And so God says, I'm going to delay, I'm going to delay because if I show up too soon, you're going to have some haters who are going to talk you out of what I'm doing for you. They're going to change your mood. You're going to get an attitude. So I need you to get your life in order because I'm not going to do it a moment too soon. Somebody shout, get your life in order. He didn't do it in the last season of your life because you had too many haters in it. He didn't do it in the last season of your life because you had too many fake friends in it. He didn't do it in the last season of your life because you were in a relationship that was never going anywhere. He didn't do it in the last season of your life because you had a negative mindset and if he would have gave you some positive, you would have still complained anyway. God says, I'm going to do it in the fullness of time. So when you get your attitude together and your relationships together and you get your friendships together and you get your money together and you get your worship life together and you get your tithe life together and you get all, then, then, then I'll show up. And that's why you see some of us with it and some of us without it because some of us have acquiesced our life for a miracle to reside. God says, I will not put new wine in old wine skins. How many of y'all ever heard that scripture? He doesn't put new wine in old wine skins. Who needs me to explain what that means? He won't put new wine in old wine skins. All right. So in the days of Jesus, they did not have bottles like us. They made their contraptions to hold their liquids out of animal skin. Are you listening to me? Animal skin, just like the leather you wear, is only good when it has elasticity. That's why it has to be uh, kept in a certain area. If you leave leather outside in the sun, it will dry out. And what will happen when you put stress on it? It'll tear easily. So the reason why God says I don't put new wine in old wineskins is because wine, watch this, and that's why it has a cork. If you ever notice when you pop the top on something uh, that has bubbles in it, it makes that noise. Why? Because it's under pressure. It's under pressure. So God says, so what I'm putting in you is so high octane, it's under pressure. But, but if I put it in something... Because the wine is going to expand. So if the, if the skin can't handle the wine, then the wine will rip and the wine, excuse me, the skin will rip and the wine will spill on the ground. So he says, I won't put my wine in something that'll rip. I can't put new wine in old wine skins. Maybe you don't drink wine. Maybe you drink Pepsi. You know how it get flat? You, you can put flat Pepsi in an old wine skin. You can't put new Pepsi in an old wine skin because it'll start to expand. God says, if you don't have expansive qualities, if, if you're not renewing your mind, help me, Holy Spirit, if you're not renewing your heart, then I can't pour myself in you because if you're old and rigid, you're going to rip and spill me on the ground. And if I wanted my glory on the ground, I would have put it there, but I'm trying to put it in you. And so in order for me to put myself in you, you're going to have to constantly renew yourself so that you can contain me. Anybody who doesn't renew their mind cannot contain God. Are you listening to me? And so God says, I'm waiting on the fullness of time. I'm waiting on you to get the right heart, the right perspective the right outlook because if I give it to you and you feel like I gave you the victory will you boast in the face of the person you defeated if I give you a victory with a defective method 
then you will, you will think that I bless that kind of behavior? So I'm waiting on your heart, your mind, your soul, your money, your friendships. I'm waiting on you to get all of that together. Somebody say the fullness of time. Say it again, the fullness of time. Listen, I'm, and I'm, I'm still, I still have to explain to you one key element to this before I'm done, but I want you to think about when Jesus was born. This is how you'll know what kind of mindset you have. There was an evil king named Herod. And when Jesus was born, he told King Herod, told the Magi, he said, I need you all to tell me the exact moment you saw the star. Because a carnal mindset is always worried about time. When is it going to be over? When is it going to start? Y'all ain't listening to me. Some of y'all here right now like, whoo, what time church going to be over? Carnal. Listen, anybody in the spirit right now, you're not even time conscious. And, and, and listen, if you are spiritual, why would you plan anything for right after church? As if you know when church is going to be over, carnal. You haven't even left God enough time to do a miracle because you got reservations at 115. So if he did show up, he got to be done by one because it's 15 minutes from here. I got an attitude face too. Oh, God help me. Y'all got me online because they ain't helping me in here. They don't like it. Time. I don't like going to church in the middle of the week. Well, what if that's when God wants to deliver? I own church two hours. That's enough for me. Okay, but what if God wanted to deliver at the third hour? Okay. And here's why we suffer. Because in America or in the Western Hemisphere, when we say time, we think chronos. Chronology. Clock. God, I want to be married by 25. I want to have a baby by 28. I want to have a house by that. Look at, look at, how many, come on now. I want to, I want to be in my career by da, da, da. I want to, we always got God on a time that suits our comfort. God says, I don't care nothing about your age. I'm not looking at your age. I'm looking at your stage. What stage of life are you in? Are you still mean? Do you still like to get even? Do you still hold grudges for years? Because if you're still doing that, baby, the fullness of time hasn't come. Because obviously all of the tragedies you've been through had not taught you the lesson I wanted you to learn. Every pain you have been through was designed to teach you how to handle what you're going to. If you don't learn the lesson of that grade level, you have to repeat the class. Raise your hand if you've ever flunked. You are literally asking God for a high school diploma on a sixth grade tolerance level. Why would I give a miracle to somebody that mentally, emotionally, and spiritually immature? You think I'm going to let you embarrass me? It ain't coming, listen to me, until when? The fullness. Say it again, the what? Chronos. Chronos. This is our problem because we do everything by time. If it don't happen by the 30th, then it ain't God. <laughs> God, if it's, if, it's, if it's you, show me by Wednesday because on Thursday, I'm going to do it my way. Come on, talk to your boy. Holler at your boy. How many of y'all put God on the clock? Come on. 
I'm, I'm assuming the rest of your arms are sore from the workout you had yesterday. I said, raise your hand if you put God on the clock. Look around. Don't put him down. Look around. Every one of us. Every one of us. God, I want it by. And then we guilt him. We guilt trip God. I've been dealing with this for. God want to say, I've been dealing with you for longer than you've been dealing with it. Chronos. And at a glance, out of the arrogance we have, we think God does things the way, but he, his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. God wasn't born in America. <laughs> he doesn't have a Houstonian point of view. Are you listening to me? He doesn't think like us. So this frame of mind influences how we see God and how we are patient through our trials and tribulations. And so we do things chronologically. God says, if you read the scripture, I use the word kairos twice as much in the scripture as I do chronos. Chronos is calendar or clock. Kairos is not about time. It's about season. Lord, help me. So when the Bible says to everything under the heavens, there is a time, not, not a five o'clock, but a season. God, help me in this place. Paul said in Galatians 4, he says, when the fullness of time has come. God sent forth a son born of a woman under the law. God wasn't waiting on the calendar to send Jesus. God was waiting on a period in history in which the conditions were correct for Christ. God, no, God. I know it is. I, it's on, I already know everybody ain't going to get it. Listen, God isn't looking at a clock to bless you. He's not looking at your age. You're the only one talking about you're too old. You're the only one talking about you're too young. God says, I'm not looking at your age. I'm looking at your stage. He says, and, and when you are ready, I don't care if you're 14 or 40, when you are ready, I will send you what you're ready to have. He's waiting on the right conditions until you have the right people in your life, until you have the right mindset, until you have the right skill set. And the blessing isn't coming a moment too soon. It is not coming under the current mindset. God is waiting on the kairos to take place in your life. In fact, I just thought about this. This is Steve Taylor right here. Steve started a security company, and the name of the security company is Cairo Security. And what you understand about that is when I met Steve, Steve was in a trailer printing T-shirts. Now he has a multi-million dollar uh, security company called Kairos. When I met him, he was getting paid chronologically. Now he's getting paid in Kairos. Y'all not listening to me in here. I'm about to help you. How many of y'all still got a moment? I'm about to show you something that's going to blow your mind. But I need you to shout it. Shout Kairos. Kairos. All right. In both Jewish and in Greek cultures, there was something called a coming of age ceremony. Okay? Where the boy stopped being a child and he started to become a man. But in the Roman custom, there was no specific age when a son became a man. Listen to me. A son became a man in biblical times when his father said he was one. I, I, I don't know if they heard me. Jerome, I don't know if they heard me. In America, your boy is a man at 18. In America, your boy is grown at 21. 
in the culture Paul was in, the father could decide that the boy was a man when he displayed the characteristics. So he might have one son that was 12 and was already a man and have another son that was 18 that wasn't a man yet because the child did not become a man until the father said, what if I told you that the only reason why God hasn't given you the benefits of your adulthood yet is he's looking at you and saying, you are still not ready. You're not going to get it until the Father says so. Ooh, Jesus, I'm preaching. Preach, Keon. They ain't going to say nothing. I think I will. You're not getting it until the Father says so. Not when you get a mustache. Not because you got money in your pocket. Not even because you got a career. Not because you got a lot of followers on social media. Not because you're the manager at the job, because you can still be in charge and be immature. Paul says, you will not get it until the father appoints the time and you have to show him that you're ready. Watch what they used to do. In, in the days of, of the Romans, a child Whatever they had as a child, as a toy, they had to give it to the god Apollo as a way of a rite of passage to say, I'm grown now. So if a girl had a doll, she had to give it to Apollo. If a boy had a toy, he had to give it to Apollo to say that no wonder Paul said, when I was a child, I thought like a child. I understood like a child. I spoke as a child. But when I put away childish thinking and speaking... When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I put away childish things. So God says, listen. You're still too petty to be picked. <laughs> Slap your neighbor. Okay. Mighty God. Say it. Say it. Mighty God. God said, you ain't gave me your doll yet. You haven't given me your baseball yet. Whatever that thing is, that childish thing in you, you ain't gave me that childish thing yet. So you're not ready to be a man. You're not ready to be a woman because you haven't put away childish thinking and speaking and seeing. You still see like a child. You still think like a child. And when you're angry, you still speak like a child. And so you are not a man or a woman yet. And I cannot give you the blessings of an adult. So that's why all of your blessings are small. Because they are the same size as you. Just in case you thought I was scared. I said your blessings are the same size as you. Now if you understand the word of God. And you understand the authority of a prophet and a priest and a preacher. You understand that those whom he loves, he also chastises. And you have to understand that I am challenging you to get out of your way. I'm challenging you to get out of your way. Why are you waiting so long to be you? You should have been rich a long time ago. You should have been married a long time ago. You should have been debt free a long time ago. Your depression should have been gone a long time ago. Your anxiety should have been gone a long time ago, but you still see, think, and speak childish. Man, when I, when I, when I, when I read comments on social media, I, we're just a world full of children. I can't believe that we are making light and making fun and memes about a submarine imploding with five human beings. On. Are we silly? That's somebody's daddy and son, and we joking? But when it is our family, we come into the altar asking for a miracle. And your family may not be dying in a submarine, but they could be dying for substandards. Called poverty 
and jealousy and envy and anger and hatred. It is amazing what we are. We have no sympathy or empathy for anybody, but when we going through, we want the whole world to be at attention. Why are we laughing at this? They shouldn't have went down there. Well, you went a whole lot of places you shouldn't have went, and you came back alive. It, come on. You've been in your own submarines. You've been in some beds you shouldn't have been in. For some people you just met that day. Come on, come on, come on. And yet you came out alive. Why? Because it wasn't your time. We got to grow up. It ain't cute no more, church. This is serious business. Don't you get wrapped up in the trick of the enemy. I saw a man, he drew, <laughs> he drew a diagram on Instagram yesterday. He drew a circle right here. And then he drew another circle right here. And he, he put an X in and he says, this is my business. And this is your business. And then he put another X and said, you have no business being in my business. So I'm going to need you to go over here and get in your business. And then he drew another circle and said, this is called a child's place. And if you are a child, I need you to get out of my building and get in a child's place. And if you are not handling your business, then you are in a child's place. You need to mind the business that pay you. Some of y'all know something about everybody's life. You know who dating who, you know who with who, you online searching it and you don't know nothing about your destiny. Get out of other folks' business and find out what God is doing with you so the fullness of time can come and you can get your family out of poverty and you can get your daughter in education and you can get your son a scholarship. Come on, talk to me, somebody. It's time. When the fullness of time has come. I thought as a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, and so as a result of being a child, I can't get the blessing. Because you do not give the miracle to a person who's not at the certain stage. Watch this. And in those days, watch this, hear me. If a father had a son, anybody still learning anything? When a father had a son... He was the heir to the father's inheritance. And yet, before the father made him a man, he had less authority in the house than the father's slaves. Did you hear what I just said? What I had just said was, <laughs> he was the father's son, but he had less freedom than the father's slave. Because until you become a man or a woman, you are beneath the slave in the father's house. So sometimes you look at folks and you think they're doing better than me. All they are is slaves. Doing a little better than you until you grow up and get your inheritance. And why are you letting slaves live better than you? You got people in the world who don't believe in God living better than you. They are slaves in the house of God. The wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous. If you hurry up and grow up, the shift can take place. He literally let the Canaanites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites hold Canaan until Israel got mature enough to walk in it. Which means literally you have slaves in your house because you won't grow up. Right now, in River Oaks, somebody living in your house because you still want to be petty. 
Right now, there's somebody living on your 55 acres with that mansion, all because you won't just settle down and stop being picky and petty and just grow up and stop thinking, speaking, and hearing childish and grow up by the word of God so you can go take your stuff. Your grandchild is waiting on you to grow up. I'm preaching. I said I'm preaching. I've been preaching almost 30 years. I know when I'm preaching because you ain't saying nothing. That's when I'm preaching. When I'm shouting, I'm, in, I'm, I'm just entertaining you. But when you're sitting there looking at me like this, you don't know whether to hate me or love me. I love you too much to have you suffer. And forgive me if it don't come off like a mama. I'm a father. I can't hold you through this one. I got to talk to you straight up, right in your face and let you know, baby girl, son, it's time. It's the fullness of time. God says, I can't give it to you until you're ready for it. How many of y'all ready? Come on now. I say, how many of y'all ready? How many of y'all ready? Ready to have your name on that business card. Ready for that business to be in your name. Ready for the LLC. Ready for your family to be happy. Ready to have joy in your house. Ready to have peace in your home. How many of y'all are ready? And I ain't just talking about no money. I'm not just talking about money. I know a lot of people with money, they still sad. I know a whole lot of people, and they got a whole lot of money, and yet they still can't find a place to lay their head. Help me in this church, Jesus. God says, you are destined to inherit the kingdom, and yet you have slaves living better than you. Not yet. I ain't ready for them to shout. Don't you let a slave outlive you. Look at yourself in the mirror and realize you were wonderfully made. He created you in his image and his likeness. And yet you have unbelievers living better than you. And happier than you and more peaceful than you, and they don't even have the joy of salvation. It's because you got to stop speaking, seeing, and thinking as a child so that the father can say, she's ready. He's ready. And when you are ready, you will start to see God work out things you've been struggling to work on. I know I'm right about it. I'm going to give you scripture. Write down Galatians 3 and 26 and Galatians 3 and 29. If you doubt me, then doubt him. Because the Bible says, likewise, we are sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And we are heirs according to the promise. Do you know what an heir is? An heir is a person who gets to have what the Father has created for no other reason than being related to him. By virtue of my death, my daughter becomes an heir of something that God gave me the ability to build that she had no part in. And as African Americans, it is hard for us to discuss this because we are often not in a position to leave anybody anything other than our debt. So we don't know about heirs. We don't know what it's like to be born rich. But how many of y'all with me? Your child going to be born rich. And if they were not born rich, they will be by the time the Lord takes you out of here because you're going to leave something behind more than just trauma. You're going to leave some tools. Who's, to, who's with me today on that? Touch somebody say, for me and mine? We gonna be all right. How many of y'all believe that? For me and mine, we gonna be all right. I'm, if I don't care how long I gotta pray, I don't care how much I gotta fast, I don't care how many habits I gotta kick, me and mine gonna be good. 
Let me hurry up. When I became a man, I put away childish things. So I'm at the point in my life right now that I don't have to get even with nobody. You know why? Because most of the people I got to get even with, I got to back up to do it. See? The people I'm trying to get even with are in front of me. I ain't got time to be back here arguing with somebody who's struggling to eat. I'm trying to get up. When you realize who you are, it'll change who you argue with. You heard me, ma'am. When you find out who you are, you're going to change who you argue with. When somebody down here, they're not worth me coming from up here to have a conversation down there. Know who you are. And you don't have to be rich to find it out. And you don't need a mansion to be somebody. You can be sleeping on your uncle's couch and still be somebody. Did you hear what I said? You are heirs of God. Did you hear what I said? That's better than being an heir to John Rockefeller. But you don't get it. That's better than being related to Elon Musk. But you don't get it. That's better than being a part of the J.P. Morgan Chase family. But you don't get it. Because this old earthly tabernacle shall dissolve. I'm an heir of somebody who built a building without using his hands, eternal in the heavens and not in the earth. And only what you do for Christ Even Jesus waited to come until it was the right time. Pastor, I never thought about this. But if you go back and study history, at the time Jesus was born, the Roman Empire had just gone through a renaissance and become a world power. So what happens when you become a world power? You build bridges and roads and infrastructure and aqueducts and water. So Jesus waited until Rome had roads he could walk on. Had he come when it was a desert, how would they have found him? He waited until they had villages and, and an emperor and a Caesar and money and roads. He waited until Rome had an infrastructure and when the fullness of time came. Then he stepped out of eternity, stepped into humanity and was able to be the son of God. Because even Jesus didn't show up too soon. Did you hear what I said? Had he existed any sooner, the message wouldn't have got out because there wouldn't have been no empire. There would have been no roads. There would have been no mail system. There would have been no currency. He wouldn't have had any tables to turn over had he come before they had money. All you in the hurry to show up too soon to find nothing. Slow down. And stop looking at somebody who's already achieved it thinking you can hurry up and get there because you don't know the struggle that they had to go through to get there. You got to go through your fullness too. Anybody you look at and say, I want my family to be just like that, let me tell you, they went through something to get their family just like that. Anybody you look at and say, I want my marriage like that, let me tell you, they went through something to get their marriage like that. I, I'm always enamored by this couple up here, the Walkers. If you all know the Walkers, let me tell you something. How long you all been married? 20, 22 years. I have never seen them not like that. I've done Zooms with them and they were at home and his wife was sitting beside him just like that you know it's, it's easy to do at church but when people at home you know at home everybody got their side of the couch you know <laughs> but I've never seen them not like that I don't know anything about their marriage but I will guarantee you 
that it didn't get like that without struggle. I guarantee you. I guarantee you there were plenty of times to say to hell with all of this. I guarantee you there were times when they looked at each other and decided, you know what, I don't like you and you don't like me. But what they did is they didn't think, see, or speak negatively or childishly. And God blesses them with a union where in spite of imperfection, they love each other unconditionally. And you'll look at them and say, I want a marriage like that, but you still... Your words are a little too sharp to have that. Your tongue a little too sharp to have that. Your mind ain't right to have that. Let me let y'all go because now I done got you. Last point. Acts chapter 2. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come. They were all with one accord in one place. Are we all here in? Y'all here, right? Are you here? Are, are you here, sir? Ma'am, are you here? Y'all here? So we're all in one place. Well, what happened on the day of Pentecost? Number one, they were all in one place. Okay, we all got that together. Here's where it gets tricky. They were all on. One now, this is where the problem arises because some of y'all listening and some of y'all done checked out already. Some of y'all ain't hungry because you're feeding on the word. And some of y'all ain't ate none of this word, so you're starving in the spirit. Some of you are already thinking about where to go next. And some of y'all are thinking about how much of my sermon you're going to use to check somebody. By the way, if God wanted them checked, they would have been here. I'm checking you. It's amazing how many people in church like, ooh, I'm going to tell Gerald this. No, God talking to you, Sarah. I'm going to get Willie Earl with this one. No, 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 Lisa, we're talking to you. Where do those names come from? Like, I don't, I don't use regular names. I always use compound names. Willie Earl is one of my favorite names anyway. But the Bible says that they were in the same place. <laughs> and they were on one accord. And because the conditions were right, suddenly. Like, okay. It didn't even take long. So, so like even right now. What if 99% of us are on one accord and we got like two people on the fence like, am I going to go all the way in or am I going to stay out? And, and, and the moment they decide I'm going to get on one accord with everybody, boom. Like, like we literally could be one second away from a corporate breakthrough. Do me a favor, look down, start talking to people on the road, say, I'm tired of being broke. I'm tired of being depressed. I'm tired of living less than a slave. I'm tired of not having my inheritance. Now, now I'm ready, but are you ready? Because all of us gotta get on the same page so we can get it all at the same time. I, let everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Give your neighbor a high five and shout neighbor. It's our season. It's our time. Now I need everybody in this room and everybody online to start shouting like it's the fullness of time. Open up your mouth and give God the praise. I can't hear nobody. I said I can't hear nobody. The conditions are right for God to perform a miracle. Do me one favor, look your neighbor in the eye and shout, neighbor, can I depend on you? Well, let me see. When I move, you move just like that. Uh, did they do anything? Find you another neighbor. Shout, neighbor, if I jump, you jump 
just like that. Did they jump with you? Find you somebody else. Shout neighbor. If I run, you run just like that. Did they do anything? Well, let's have a Holy Ghost party. Slap your neighbor on the hand and tell them, neighbor, I have a prophecy. God told me to tell you it's your time. If they didn't act, if they didn't act, if they didn't act a fool, if they didn't act up, you got the wrong neighbor. Shout, neighbor, it's your time. Oh my God. Oh my God, I feel something. Ask your neighbor, do you have the right mindset? Do you have the right skill set? Do you have the right mindset? Do you have the right skill set? Do you have the right worship? Do you have the right heart? Because I'm tired of living beneath my means. I'm tired of being in the wrong room. I feel like this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us, let us, some of y'all don't know you in us. I said, let us rejoice and be glad in it. Shout it, yeah. Oh. Shout it, yeah. I didn't get dressed, drive 30 minutes, sit next to somebody I don't know, and not leave here with a breakthrough. I believe I'm sitting next to somebody who's on assignment to help us both get a breakthrough. Tell your neighbor, this ain't no accident, this ain't no accident. This is an appointment, this is an appointment. I got your back and you got my back. Over the next 30 seconds, I'm about to shout for your daughter. Over the next 30 seconds, I'm about to shout for your son. Over the next 30 seconds, I'm about to shout for your miracle. Shout it, yeah! 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 It's your time, 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 it's your time. I swear to you, when it's your time, everything will just start working out. I got some things I'm asking God to do. I got some things that can't nobody do but him. And I got to stop thinking, seeing, and speaking negatively. I got to I got to put away childish things so that the Father can say, I'm ready. Thou good and faithful servant, you've been faithful over a few things. Now it is your time, Kairos, to be ruler over much. Hallelujah. Lift your hands. Father God, we need you today. Turn it around in our favor. And maybe where we are is our fault, but you are God of grace and mercy. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for that. Lord, show us your glory. <laughs> show us your glory. 
there will be glory after this. It won't always be like this, Lord. We know you will perfect that which concern us. But just give us the patience to wait until sooner and later becomes right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, somebody use your heavenly language. Begin to speak to him in this place. Come on, use your language. Use your language. It's easy to clap, but open your mouth. Come on, say something to him. The Bible says when you clap, you summon angels, but when you want to talk to God, you got to use your voice. Come on, open up your mouth. Turning around. Turning around for me. It won't always be like this. That which concerns. Sooner or later, it's gonna turn in your favor. Turn it around for me. Hallelujah. Listen, I've, I've told, I told you guys this. I, I, I promise, this has been probably the most trying 10 days. I've had in a long time. I'm going through some things while I'm trying to get my work in order. And yet, while I'm talking to you, um, my brother is, is, is still in intensive care. And about, I'm guessing, almost two weeks ago, I'm, I'm guessing 10 days ago, it was a Wednesday, and my wife and I literally were in Bush Airport, IAH, and we were at gate D1, headed to Orlando for something that my wife had to do for work, literally standing behind her. My phone rings, it's my sister-in-law screaming. And she said, it's T, that's what we call my brother. I said, well, well, what's wrong? She said he was, she said, all I know is he was working out and he threw his last punch. Uh, he was boxing, he threw his last punch and then he just fell. Thank God he was cogn cognitive enough. He called 911 himself. Sometimes you got to know when you're in trouble. Ambulance shows up, takes him to the hospital. They do a test on him and they find that he has, his, his brain is bleeding. They can't find out where it's coming from, so they send him to another hospital. They take several tests. After a day or two, they find out that he not only had one, but two aneurysms. What gate are we at? D1. When she called me, I literally started sweating the same way I'm sweating right now. It was almost as if I was preaching a sermon. I couldn't believe the news. My wife said, what's wrong? I walked away, went into the restroom, got the sweat off of my head, wiped the tears out of my eyes, came back out. She said, is everything all right? I said, that was Mo. This is what she just said. Called back, put my wife on the phone with her. My wife says, we can't go where we're going with her sounding like that. This is at 6 o'clock. The flight leaves at 619. She calls a travel agent. She says, Sarah, we, we got to change plans. We're going to Orlando, but we need to go to San Diego. So now we're talking about the entire opposite end of the country. She says, okay, well, let me look at it. I don't know what happens, but my wife leaves the line. She goes to the screens and she starts to look at the board. I guess they're talking about what flight. She says, there's only one more flight that goes out of Bush today that goes to San Diego. It leaves at seven. Anybody ever flown out of Bush? There are 161 gates. 
in that airport. And if you got to go from D to E or from C to A, it's at least 25, 30 minutes to get there. My wife says, you're not going to believe this. The flight that goes to San Diego leaves from gate D1. So all we have to do is sit down and wait on God. And the equivalent of time, listen to me, we would not have gotten to Orlando until 9 o'clock. We got to San Diego at 8 o'clock because of the time difference. So we showed up where we were not scheduled to go sooner. then we would have gotten if we had gone where we were set to go. I have no doubt in my mind that that was a Kairos moment. We were never going to Orlando. But God needed us in the airport at the time we needed to be in the airport, at the exact gate we needed to be at so that we could leave when we needed to leave. We were never going to Orlando. My wife was never going to do a job there, but he had to use the things he knew what we would respond to to get us where we needed to be. All I'm telling you is, it might look like you're going one place. It might look like it's going another direction. All God is doing is strategically getting you to the place. That's called the fullness of time where everything works out for you to be exactly where you need to be. And out of the last 10 days, my wife and I have been in the hospital with him for six, which means I have flown back here to preach to you, flown back here to have my staff meetings, flown back there to sit in the hospital five hours a day, to fly back here to do my job with you, to preaching in Atlanta yesterday. to not saying, I'm tired, I need a day off. I got a job to do. And I flew back here to be with you because this is my Kairos. This is, can't nobody do this job but me because I'm appointed to do it. And there was a job that nobody can do but you. And you can't be too tired to do your job. And you can't be too hurt to do your job. And you can't be too frustrated to do your job. You got to do it while you're struggling. You got to do it while your heart is broken. I'll cry later, but now I have to preach. And that's how I know God knows I'm ready because I'll do anything to be in my purpose. Ain't no mountain too high. Ain't no valley too low. Ain't no river too wide for me to do what God has called me to do. I will be on the wall when it is my time and my season. If this sermon was for you, and you believe that your kairos, your fullness of time is here, can you begin to just pray on your own for 30 seconds and then we're gonna leave? Come on, online, I need you to do it. I can't, I don't know what you need. He's turning around for you. He's, it won't always. Lord will perfect that which concerns you. Sooner or later, it will, it will, it will, it will. Ooh, turn it around, yeah. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh upon us. Get us to our gate. Get us to our place, get us to our season, because we believe the fullness of time has come. We've paid our dues, we've had our struggles, we've prayed our prayers. Now we're ready to walk into destiny. In Jesus' name we pray. If you believe it, come on, put those hands together and bless the Lord in this place. Come on, it's giving time. Come on and give him glory. It's giving time. Hallelujah. If you need an envelope, raise your hand, raise your hand. If you're gonna give electronically, you give that way. Those of you all who are watching me online, 
I want you to be faithful in your giving today, not because I ask, but because God says it's just right to do. Can I tell you something? I've been, I've been a faithful giver to God. And this, is, this is the truth. My mother taught me to tithe when I was six. We used to have to take, we, we got allowance. Um, and my mom would give us these little plastic Ziploc bags and we had to put 10% of our money in the plastic Ziploc bag and we had to take that bag to church every Sunday to tithe. And from that moment until this moment, I've seen the blessings of the Lord over my life because all of this time I've been faithful. And here's why, because all of my life has been faithful. How many know that God is faithful? So when you give, this isn't a gimmick. The Bible says, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, shall men give unto your bosoms. God says, when you give to me, I will make sure that people with money have you on their mind when they're looking to get rid of it. I'll make sure that bosses give you raises. I'll make sure that companies hire your skill set. Some of y'all, the only thing between you and wealth is you haven't started the company God has told you to start yet. God wants to do something through you. If you believe that this is your due season to operate in fullness and wealth, I want you to stand on your feet. I don't want you to give seated today. I want you to give on your feet. Watch this. For those of y'all who said, you know what, I'm, I, don't, I hadn't even planned on giving today. I hadn't planned on tithing today. I thought about something. I was listening to a, a podcast yesterday. And I can't get into all of the nuances of why this is important, but there is a number uh, that is associated with wealth. It is the number 28. I want you to pay attention to this. Anytime you see a Rolex being uh, marketed, the date always says the 28. I don't, I don't have time to break it all down. You're just gonna have to trust me that the number 20, Bill Gates was born on the 28. Okay, there, was a, there was something about wealth and this number 28, but I'll, look it up. You can Google it right now. Now, if you, if you Google a Rolex that's being resold by somebody else, you're not going to see this date. But Rolex themselves, they always set the date for the 28th. Every billboard. So if you haven't decided what you're going to give today, I challenge you to give a $28 seed to say, God, I'm ready to be wealthy. And I'm going to start with this $28 seed as a way of showing you that when you speak to me, I respond. Hallelujah to the name of the Lord. How many of you are ready to be blessed? All right. Do me a favor. Tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, you are not that quiet when you thought the blessing was going to be given to you. It's amazing how we get quiet when we got to do something to get it. And this is what separates the wheat from the tear. This is why. Listen to me. Look at me. We don't have a top 3% only because of segregation and racial disparity. We have a top three 1% because the top three and 1%, they follow a principle even if they don't believe in God. Give and it shall be given. That's why every wealthy person you know has a foundation. So God has to follow his law even if you don't believe in him. That's why you have rich devils because they follow principles and God has to honor his word even if you don't believe in him. Now, what more would he do for those of us who call him Lord and Savior and Christ? I want you to proceed this gift with a worship. If you are getting ready to give and you want God to bless your life, get unsleepy for five seconds and give him glory. Give him glory. Yeah, that ain't good enough. I said give him glory. As I move towards greater, I will accept all divine ideas, thoughts, or concepts that will connect me to my destiny. I believe that what Jesus Christ has done for me is bigger than what anyone has, can, and will do to me. And because of his full gift, I will lend to many nations, but will borrow from none. If you believe that, shout you talk.